Well, let's take our Bibles and look in Ecclesiastes again. Last time we did a summary of chapters 1 and 2. And today I want to start chapter 3. There's too much here to be able to look at or consider in one setting. But my text will be from verse 1 down to verse 11. And I've entitled this simply God's Purpose for Everything. A lot of people wonder, well, is everything by design? Or are there some things that take place that aren't necessarily ordained by God? Well, after reading this particular portion of Scripture, it should leave no doubt. Those of us that believe the Bible and uh, believe it to be God's Word, His inspired Word, there's no question that everything that takes place is according to His purpose. That's stated here in verse 1 of Ecclesiastes 3. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Now when you stop and think about seasons, when did seasons begin? Well, you go all the way back to the creation of the world. When was time created? When did time begin? In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so that's when time as we know it began. God is eternal, but he has a purpose that he has revealed in the unfolding of time. And really... That's what we have here in the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It's the revelation of God's purpose for time and history. You can go all the way back to creation. And then when you get to Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10, it states there that the very one who created all things and set time in motion will declare and decree when time will be no more. That's difficult for us to even fathom, the fact that throughout eternity there will not be time. We're time creatures. That's how God has made us. And so immediately here we have that expression, not for some things there is a season, but to everything there is a season. There's not one thing that you can think of in your mind that is not tied back to God's purpose. It says, in a time to every purpose under heaven. That word purpose actually is the word delight or good pleasure. And we have scriptures that describe all things being according to God's good pleasure. It may not be according to our good pleasure, but it is according to His. And I've often stated, looking forward, we don't know one second from now what God has purposed, but we can look back. And this is true in the history of the world, but even in our own particular lives. We can look back and see that God Himself traced the path that we're on, good, bad, and ugly. Remember what Joseph said concerning his brothers after all those years there in Genesis 50. He said, you meant it for evil, but God what purposed it for good. That would be a good study for each of us to do. Take your concordance and look up the word purpose or purposed or good pleasure. And you'll see how all things come from God according to his good pleasure. Now, we could spend time defining what time is. It's a measure. We measure things by time. Even my preaching here, we have a time set for this to begin and for us to come together. So we're time driven. Time is a measure of what takes place. And there are different increments of time. You can talk about years. 
You can talk about months, you can talk about weeks, you can talk about minutes, and even now, they have time measures that measure even nanoseconds. Let's say it's a race and it comes right down to the wire. There are electronic devices now that can determine a winner just based on nanoseconds. But all of this God has purposed, even our ability to calculate time. When you stop and think about how even before the sundial, everything was directed by the sun rising, the sun setting, and months and seasons established. And then you read in scripture about the sundial. It seems like over the passage of time, God gave man the ability to be able to track time in a more sophisticated way to the point where today we have all kinds of time pieces. My grandfather was a clock maker and he had his shop set up down in the basement and he would make different clocks and order different parts for those clocks and then he would set them up in uh, the house. And it was interesting if you went to stay with him every 15 minutes there was a clock going off sounding somewhere eventually you got accustomed to hearing it but it was a reminder that all things take place in time think about our memories recalling moments in time that's what time is made up of different moments and we measure things by those moments Think about all the things that have taken place in your life. Those are in the unfolding of time according to God's purpose. Now it's understood as we saw last time that Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes toward the end of his years. It seems that the older we get, the more we value time passing because we realize as, as time passes, we're getting closer to that ordained time, that expiration date that God himself has ordained. When you're younger, you don't think about it. You're just going, getting up and living each day, but it's good to reflect on time. And the scriptures encourage us to redeem the time, thinking about how once it's passed, you don't get it back. So here Solomon is reflecting toward the end of his years as a type of summation even of what he had learned about life. And as he pondered time and particularly the cycles and the seasons, he, by the Spirit of God, writes what God was pleased to teach him. And so here in verses 1 through 8, we see where everything is according to God's purpose, God's decree. God's determining, God's good pleasure, different words that we find in Scripture to show that all things are of God. It says here, a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. Can you think of anything that you could add here that is not included? This shows how specific then the word is with regard to God's purpose and all that takes place in our lives. Back in 1965, there was a group 
of singers called the Birds. And I remember that's when the song became popular. It was called Turn, Turn, Turn. And the lyrics were taken right from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Now they wrote it at a time when the Vietnam War was at its hottest moment. Soldiers were dying. There was a lot of turmoil in the United States and around the world about the war. And they were writing this song and singing it to show that even that was seasonal. That there would be a time to kill, but there would be a time to heal. And so they wrote that song with that in mind, taken right from the scripture. But what we have here really is a form of poetry in this list describing the different seasons and facets of life and how beautifully it is written. I don't think anybody could sit down and write a more beautiful poem than what we have here from Solomon. And who better to write it than a man to whom God had given all wisdom and had lived his life through every possible season. In fact, as he's writing here, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, I'm sure he's thinking back over his life at all the various events and things that have taken place. And I'm sure any one of us might be a good little project to do, write a journal based upon these different times. When was I born? Well, we don't know when we're going to die, but we know that time is appointed of God. It's not up to us. And so some of this you may look at and think, well, how dark? Because it's talking about a time to kill, time to weep. All of these things that perhaps we try to put out of our memory, and yet God has purposed every detail. When I read this more particularly, though, I think about God's purpose in time. Why has he created the world? Why has he set time in motion? What is history all about? Well, you've heard me say before, it's his story. The history of the world and the history of the Bible is the history of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the creator. All things that have been made were made by him. And it is to his honor and glory that all things subsist and exist. You can see, for example, over in Revelation chapter 4, how the Lord directed John to write this in the book of Revelation chapter 4. As John considered in his day all that was taking place in the persecution. And everything that he was seeing, and yet we read there in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11. This would be a good verse to underscore. Thou art worthy, O Lord. Who is he speaking of here? He's speaking of Christ as the Lord in whose hands God has put all judgment. To receive what? Glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things. There again, we know that all things exist because Christ is the creator. And he's the sustainer of all things. And what? For thy pleasure. See, that's the word back here in Ecclesiastes in the Hebrew. Which is, which is the word for purpose. For his purpose, his pleasure, they are and were created. So when things occur in our lives that we wonder about and don't understand particularly, this one thing we do know, that it is according to God's purpose in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're the Lord's, we rest in that. And we're thankful for that. But even here in this poem, 
that I've just read for you in verses 2 down to verse 8. Think about how it pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ. If all things are for God's purpose in Christ, and as we read there in Revelation 4 and verse 11, for his good pleasure they are and were created, then we can actually go back and read these verses as they pertain to the Lord Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. In fact, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, we read that in the fullness of the time, sometimes we misquote that, but if you, for example, just look at it with me in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. When Paul is writing here about the outworking of God's purpose in time, for the salvation of his people. It required Christ coming and taking on flesh, even though he was God of very God. He was the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, and yet he, what I like to refer to as the divine stoop. He created this world and then stepped into this world and subjected himself to time, him being infinite. And timeless as God, yet he stepped into time and submitted himself as a man in a body for the outworking of that salvation that his father had purposed for sinners. And that's why we read here in Galatians 4 and verse 4, but when the fullness, here's what I said, don't misquote it or miss it, of the time, that's a definite article. That means that from God's purpose, before time, now in time, Christ came at that time, specific time when he was born in this world to accomplish his purpose for the saving of sinners. I love that definite article. That when that time was come, see from creation all the way through to Christ's coming. Everything was done in type and picture and prophecy and promise in the Old Testament, but now in the fullness of the time. The Old Testament announced that he was coming, and the New Testament announces that he has come. What a beautiful picture of what we're reading here. God sent forth his son, made of a woman. That was prophesied all the way back there in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, that he would be the seed of a woman, the virgin, and made under the law. What's the Old Testament about? It's the law. What God requires that no man could fulfill, that it could only condemn, and yet he was made under that law that he might earn and establish that righteousness necessary for God to be just and justify those sinners that he purposed to save. And thereby what? Verse 5, to redeem. That's why I say the whole purpose of history and time is the redemption of those that God the Father purposed to save before time and has created and now have been put in this history, this platform of time all the way from the beginning to the end to redeem those that were under the law that we might receive what the adoption of sons and because your sons god has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying abba father so that's why when we come back here to ecclesiastes chapter 3 i would encourage us to read this as it pertains to the lord jesus christ a time to be born that was at a specific time a specific place and a time to die. Christ did not die because of any natural cause. His death was an execution of justice. Yes, wicked men took and crucified him. But again, if you look in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, what did Peter declare about Christ's death in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. 
it says him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. So when you talk about a time to die, he didn't die one second before or after what God the Father had purposed. They sought to kill our Lord Jesus Christ many times, but they could not lay their hand on him. Here in Acts 2.23, it says he was delivered by the determinate counsel. Those two words would describe our word purpose here. That to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. He died according to God's purpose, God's good pleasure. Isaiah wrote about it in Isaiah 53 that it pleased God to bruise him. When it says it pleased God, it's not that God the Father somehow took delight in just how men were treating him, but it pleased God. It was according to God's purpose that all things should befall his son to work out that salvation, to earn and establish righteousness for God to be just and justified. And therefore, it says, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. They delivered up the Lamb of God, but it was according to God's determinate counsel. And that says in foreknowledge. That's where a lot of people get that wrong, too. They say, well, foreknowledge, that means God looking down through time and seeing what men would do and then acting accordingly. No. The word foreknowledge is God's prior knowledge his foreknowledge of what he has decreed already. He knows all things beforehand because he's decreed all things beforehand. And so you see that necessary connection here in verse 23 between the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. The reason God knows all things is because he has determined all things even before they take place. And... Uh, a time to plant. Coming back here to my text in Ecclesiastes 3. You think about how the scriptures talk about Christ being a seed sown in the ground. That unless that seed be sown and die, then it cannot bring forth fruit. Indeed, you see the connection. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Think about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ being as a harvest where by that seed was planted in his death and from that comes forth what is used to make bread. He's the bread of life. That harvest is cut down and taken and put in the mill and ground and then roasted. All of that is a picture of of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ and that work that he came to accomplish that he might be the savior of sinners. There's a time to kill. That's literally what they did to the Lord Jesus Christ. Like the Old Testament, there was a specific time when those sacrifices were to be slain. Not before, not after. And the Lord told Moses to remind Aaron to do everything according to the pattern that he determined because it was a reflection of what God's purpose was in heaven concerning his son. A time to kill. You think about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Passover lamb. It was at a specific time that he was slain because he was the Passover lamb. And a time to heal. You stop and think about Though Christ was put to death, yet he rose again. And that through his work, through his satisfaction, the fact that he was raised from the grave, we could say it was a time of healing. Not only for him, no longer could he suffer or would he suffer as a sin bearer because it was finished. But think about what that produced for his people. A time to break down. What did the Lord Jesus Christ do in his coming? He tore down all of that old economy that was made up of types and pictures and prophecies. He didn't just set it aside. He tore it down. And in order to build up, what did he build up? A spiritual house. 
a spiritual temple. We still have people running around today thinking that it's in the natural, and they're looking for a natural kingdom on earth or a natural rule of Christ one day in that place called Jerusalem. No, that's all been torn down. In fact, God purposed it physically in A.D. 70 when he destroyed that temple for the last time. But a time to build up what is being built up right now other than Christ's church. Christ said that, I will build my church. The building up and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Yes, a time to weep. Christ is called the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, but a time to laugh. In that sense, rejoice. I love now that as we look back and God by his spirit gives us eyes to see. Yes, it is mournful when you consider that my sins nailed him to that cross. He did not die for any sin of his own. He was never, never made a sinner. But the, the sin of his people was charged to him. And yes, a time of weeping. I can't even consider what that means other than that causing me to weep over my own sin. And yet, a time to laugh in the sense of rejoice why? Because that sin has been put away. Oh, what a blessed work the spirit of grace does in the hearts of those for whom Christ died when they see the full result and effect of what he accomplished. Oh, how we laugh in the sense of rejoicing. It makes the heart merry. A time to mourn. Yes, there's much about my sin and what Christ endured as the sin bearer the man of sorrows, and yet a time to dance. That dance means now delight. And that's what we do whenever we meet to hear the blessed gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not physically getting up out of our seats and dancing, but I'll tell you, there's times when the gospels preach, your heart leaps, and you rejoice. And if you could get away with it, you probably would get up and click your heels and think, praise God. It's not just an emotional thing, but it's how deeply this gospel causes us to rejoice in what Christ has done. It says here, a time to cast away stones. In the ancient world, you would commonly take stones after a battle and scatter those stones over the enemy's land for the purpose of hindering farming. And I see this fulfilled particularly in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his finished work, a time to cast away stones, there's no going back to that old economy. In fact, we're warned against it, not to go back and desire to be again under the law. What Christ has accomplished is, is what enemies would, who were conquered would find from those that conquered them that they were not to go back and till the ground. The stones were cast over that ground to hinder them from going back and digging it again and trying to make something of it. That's why we don't go back under the law that Christ the stone has come and from him now there is the gathering of stones together. What is it, the gathering of those stones? Those are those precious stones. Those that God has purpose should be built upon this foundation of Christ and therefore much rejoicing. A time to embrace. In other words, that when God is pleased by his spirit to teach us of Christ, oh, how we embrace him. And any of us that have been taught by the spirit of God know how refreshing that time was. When our eyes were open and we beheld in Christ all his glory and uh, his redemption. But then it says a time to refrain from embracing. It's not every time and all times that we fully see Christ as, as we desire. There are times where it seems that he has withdrawn his hand from us. I can tell you over the years, many times that I've wept because it seems that Christ's presence was taken from me. But that's just 
how God purposed it, just like in the book of Song of Solomon, when the bride was asleep and she heard the handle rattle on the door and she woke up and got up to see and it was her beloved, but he was gone. And so she ran out in the street looking for him. There are times when the Lord puts us through such seasons. We would love to see him more plainly and more clearly as we did when he first opened our heart. And yet he purposes at times to withdraw himself. That's what a time to refrain from embracing that we might desire him all the more. There's a time to get and a time to lose. God's purposed, when you talk about getting what we know of Christ and salvation, is the time of his revealing him in our hearts. But there's also here a time to lose. In other words, that everything about this life is to an end and a purpose and will be over. A time to keep and a time to cast away. When you think about our Lord Jesus Christ, his time to get, in other words, his coming to work out that salvation was a time of getting. You say, well, what would be a time to lose? Well, when he died on that cross, there was the putting away once for all of the sin of his people. In fact, Colossians describes it as a circumcision, the cutting away of the flesh. That was a time to lose. Thank God. Because when Christ went to that cross, that sin would be no more. In fact, the scriptures describe it as being buried in the deepest sea where it cannot be seen anymore. That's a blessing. Sometimes when God takes things away, we cry over what he's taken away because we hold on to it so tightly. But here's an instance where I'm thankful that that time to lose was when Christ paid the sin debt and it was put away. A time to keep, the Lord had to keep the law. He had to fulfill it in every way. He kept all that the Father purposed that he should accomplish, and then a time to cast away. In other words, that was a one-time putting away of sin and a justifying, declaring righteous of his people. So for that reason, we don't go back to the law. We don't go back to anything that we think we need to do in order to be justified before God. It's finished. All of that has been put away. There's a time to rend, and that's certainly what took place when Christ died on the cross. There was a rending of that veil in the temple from top to bottom that showed that that Old Testament economy would no longer be in force. And then a time to sow. What has he sown? Well, he's put together, I love this, a garment through the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ that he came and earned and established. There's been a garment sewn, not by man. Someone said if one thread of that garment of righteousness we've put in there, the whole thing would be unraveled. Now, when you think about sewing, you think about the garment of righteousness that Christ established and earned and with which he has now clothed every one of those for whom he paid the sin debt. He rent that old garment. That's what Christ said. You can't take new wine and put in old wineskins. It has to be completely rent and anew established. There's a time to keep silence. I think about in Christ's death where the disciples, particularly Peter, thought that he could rush in and he had something to contribute. He had, and the Lord put him aside. That was a time to keep silence when Christ would go in before the Father and lay down his life and offer up his righteousness to the Father for acceptance and then a time to speak. I love that when the Lord Jesus Christ was raised 
from the grave. He came back, and what did he speak to his disciples? Peace. And what are we enjoying today in reading these scriptures? Christ has spoken. His word is there for our comfort because of his great work. There's a time to love. Stop and think about who the Lord loves. He loves everyone that the Father gave him. But there's a time to hate. There are those that he hates. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. I know people think that's unfair, but there's a, a time for love. A time of love for those that God purposed to save was when he... First of all, Christ came and laid down his life. Greater, greater love hath no man than this, than that he should lay down his life for his friends. But there's a time of love of which it speaks there in Ezekiel when the Spirit comes and reveals Christ in the heart. We wouldn't know the love of God. We wouldn't know the work of the Lord Jesus Christ were it not for his spirit. And when we look back and see how Christ was revealed in the heart by being born from above, oh, what a time of love. But there's a time to hate. In other words, God has purposed that some will know nothing more than his hatred. And he's just in that. There are vessels of mercy and there are vessels of wrath. And then a time of war. What was the time of war for Christ? It was coming and accomplishing all that was necessary and taking on every enemy of his people. His coming in this world was a warfare all the way up to his death. And you think about who are the enemies of Christ, but particularly of his people. Well, it's the world, it's our own sin. That's what condemns us. It's Satan. That warfare had been going on from the time that Satan was cast out from heaven. A time of war. But oh, I love this. A time of peace. That's what Paul writes about over here in Romans chapter 5. If you look there with me. Those that are the Lord's, they enjoy now this time of peace. Peace. Peace that passes all understanding. It's not an emotion, but it's a reconciliation. So complete was the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that when he laid down his life, he finished the work. There remained nothing but peace to give to those for whom he died. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, it said, Who was delivered for our offenses... And was raised again for our justification. When you see that little word for, it means because of. Back in the day when they had those uh, wanted posters. For example, Jesse James, wanted for murder. That word for doesn't mean they were not looking uh, for him in order that he murder. <laughs> no, he's wanted because of murder. And the same word is used here, who was delivered for or because of our offenses. You see, that's the warfare. It took the Lord coming, doing, and dying in order to deal with our offenses, those of us that God purposed to save. But here's the time of peace. Was raised again for or because of our justification. That's how peace has been established between a holy God and those sinners for whom Christ went to war. In fact, he's called a man of war. He's called the captain of our salvation. But the sure result is so wonderful to read. He didn't come to attempt to accomplish salvation. He came to save. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people. Shall save his people from their sin. And that's where you get into verse chapter 5 and verse 1. Remember, chapter divisions were put in later by editors, but you could read it just from verse 25 into verse 1. Therefore, now remember, there was no punctuation in the original text. And uh, here, I believe the editors 
put the comma in the wrong place. I know some have heard me say that before and they go, they gasp. <gasps> You're changing God's word. There weren't any punctuations in the original, so we're not changing anything. What we're doing is clarifying. And here it says, therefore being justified. If you're going to put a comma anywhere, put it there. Being justified how? Through what was described in chapter 4 and verse 25. Therefore being justified, having been declared righteous, how is it that sinners are declared righteous? It's through the work that Christ accomplished at the cross, justified by his shed blood. What's the result? By faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when God grants that faith, that's where we have peace ourselves in our spirit with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith. It's not by your believing. That faith is a noun. It's by, you could put there as a synonym, by Christ. Therefore being justified, by Christ we have peace with God. And that's what it says there, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith has one object. It's the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his person. What he accomplished. Therefore, by whom also. See, salvation is not a plan. It's not a presentation. It's a person by whom also we have access by faith. How do I know these things are so? By faith, by what's revealed here in the scriptures concerning Christ. The faith once delivered unto all saints. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And what? Rejoice. There's that time of dancing. In hope. Of the glory of God. What a beautiful portion of scripture there is there. So I'm going to stop there for now. And Lord willing we'll pick up from verse 9 forward next time. Where Solomon asks the question. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men. To be exercised in it. We'll look at that, Lord willing, the next time. But may he be pleased to bless his word to our hearts and what we've heard in this message. Amen.